recording started good morning everyone welcome to today's session on the book of old testament survey and today we would be starting on the book of judges before we could start with our class can i request one of us to please start with a word of prayer Can I? Yes, please. Yes, Tabia. Thank you, Father. Thank you uh, for this wonderful time, Lord, that you've given us to come before you, Lord, to learn from your word, to know more of you, Father. I pray, Lord, we invite the Holy Spirit, Lord, to inspire us, Lord, to teach us, to guide us, uh, Father, Lord, that we may uh, rightly know you, Father, Lord, that we may come closer to you father have a deeper relationship with you i especially commit a pastor into your loving hands lord you bless her father you equip and empower her father lord you give her the words to speak father lord all that father you want to convey to us, Father Lord, uh, let it be spoken through her, Father. We bless her in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray for each and every student. Father Lord, we thank you, Father, for bringing each one of us here, Lord. It is not by accident, Father Lord. We are here by your plan and your purpose, Father Lord. What you want us to hear, what you want us to apply in our lives, may you make it known to us, Lord. Give us the revelation knowledge, Father. And uh, Lord, and we pray for the spirit of the wisdom and revelation uh, to know you, Father. All these we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Divya. Before, Okay, so today we're going to study on the book of Judges. So before we could start with the class, I will just project our notes. Book of Judges, who was the author of this book? Who was Joshua. the author of this book? Joshua. Uh -huh. Anyone else who was the author of this book? Okay, they say Samuel to be the author of this book. Okay, and uh, the events described in the book of Judges were just after the death of Joshua. So to the beginning of the monarchy of span of 335 years, that is between 1380 BC to 1045. So this means that maybe Samuel, who lived about 30 to 40 years into the reign of Saul, could have been its author. Uh, we also see that in the New Testament, suggestion period of the judges lasted for about 450 years. We see that in the book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 20. Uh, let's go. Uh, let's see the background of this book. The background of Judges opens with the closing days of the life of Joshua. In chapter uh, one, we see how Joshua, uh, along with the Israelites' army, conquered many places. They fought with uh, with uh, fought many battles with the king of Canaanites. And in chapter two, we see the death of Joshua, which gives us. Uh, you know, a clear picture. And uh, after Joshua's death, we see a downfall uh, of Israelites with the other nation. And everyone did uh, what they felt right in their own eyes because um, Joshua gave the land which they conquered to the 12 tribes. I will show the map in some time. Uh, the 12 tribes scattered in the place in the land of Can Canaanites uh, into each position as it was allocated by Joshua. As they conquered, they captured each tribe according to their tribe and the size of each tribe. Joshua allocated the land. So now what happened? The older generation were passing away. OK, so then now we have the new generation. They don't know what the Lord has done. And, you know, they started to live their life, uh, uh, what they felt was right in their eyes. So uh, 
and uh, they started sinning they started mingling with the canaanites who stayed in that land and you know uh, so we see that there was a need of a proper leader a proper leader and we see how uh, how their disobedience okay uh, led to the uh, uh, led to sin and we can also see the consequence of their sin in this people life and how now when they cried out to the lord how god delivered them is what the story of judges all about so with this um, we'll see uh, there are three type of judges we see that the warrior judge like the Gideon and uh, there's a priest judge like Eli and the prophet judge like Samuel and we also see Deborah also being the prophetess uh, we see the author date the very purpose of this book to continue the history of Israel uh, to show the nation and also it uh, it also dictates the death of Joshua to the time of Samuel. Uh, it also shows the external threat of defeat by the other nations is not as serious as the internal threat, their own uh, immorality and the idolatry which led them to their defeat and uh, the third point we also see that god how god raised judges um you know or the leaders in time of trouble uh, to deliver the people of israel and um, we also see that you know god was mindful of uh, israelites even though they sinned and they went astray but uh, when they called just like how a child calls to the father and the father in all his kindness and mercy in love he tries to redeem their children we see that picture here so much of god redeeming israelites again and again again and again and the fourth point we see is Israel uh, uh, human kingship uh, was needed to deliver the people, to lead the people. And we will study on many other judges. And yes, uh, we see there was a cycle, a repetitive cycle that is sin, servitude, and then again the supplication and the salvation sin the rebellion nature of israelite servitude was a people the israelites started worshiping the idols of that place like the baal god and supplication was when uh, when they were oppressed when they were oppressed uh, they started seeking the one true god and they started delivered them through the judges and uh, we also see uh, the salvation is God bringing rest and deliverance by raising the judges or raising the leaders. So in the book of Judges, uh, we see about, you know, uh, 13 leaders, 13 leaders. And in the book of Samuel, the two leaders have been recorded like Eli and Samuel. So we have the judges who are raised in the book of Judges. And today, uh, in this, uh, though they were uh, 15, we will be covering on four, uh, four judges to talk about due to the time constraint. Uh, yeah, the teaching from Judges, we see the wickedness of the human art and uh, God delights in using the weak things so that his glory has been seen in and through us. And the third, we see the Holy Spirit in the Judges, how the Spirit of the Lord came upon each and every judge and he moved them to deliver them, he moved them to give the right decision, he moved upon them to give them the strategy, how the Holy Spirit led the judges we see throughout in the book of judges and um, yeah the comparison with the book of joshua we see that how joshua was strong sustained leadership and there was unity among the tribes um, but in judges there was no sustained leader and there were no unity among the tribes and in joshua we see israel takes land from the canaanites okay but in judges we see uh you know canaanites taking the land back from israel and joshua emphasizes obedience 
you know when we obey god we see the victory and we can enjoy the freedom that comes from god but in judges we see the disobedience which led them to be defeated and then led them to slavery and bondage among the other kingdoms with this we'll also move on to the outline we have a very detailed outline how the uh, you know uh, what happened in the uh, book of judges how the people failed and uh, who are the judges that rules at northern central eastern western camp wherever people camped and they stayed and who ruled them who were the judges in each places we see that and we also see the portrayal of the shadow of christ in the book of judges saying that each judge was the savior or a ruler uh, they when the holy spirit moved upon them they started dictating to the israelites the strategies the things that they need to do how they can go for the battle and how god can give us the victory they started uh, telling them so through whenever there was a problem and people cried out to god god raised a judge and that that judge became the savior that judge became the deliverer that judge became the redeemer of that set of tribe tribe so we see portray of christ um in for, uh, in the book of judges as the judge or as a deliverer as a ruler yeah so with this we will go to the presentation One second, I'll just start the presentation in the book of Judges. Yeah. Everyone can see this presentation. So the book of Judges is all about tears, triumph and strategy. Can we all see this? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So the Israelites, after setting into the promised land, now they no more dwell in the tents. Now they have uh, uh, occupied the land. And uh, there were still a lot of land to be taken from the Canaanites in those areas. So in chapter 2 and 3, we see how they were led by Joshua to capture many land. And, you know, uh, so Joshua also segregates these lands to the different tribes. We see that here. Okay, so to uh, Joshua gives the land to all the 12 tribes, 12 tribes of Israel, according to their size, he, he shares it among them. And then after that, we see the death of Joshua in chapter two. Let's turn to book of Joshua as well. Sorry, not Joshua, book of Judges. Okay, and in chapter two, we see the death of Joshua. Uh, so after the death of Joshua, the Israelites compromised on God's command to eradicate the immoral and the corrupt Canaanites from the land. And as a result, sorry, where are we here? Okay. Okay. Uh, as a re result, they ended up repeatedly falling into the idolatry and uh, immorality of that nation. So the descendants who had, uh, uh, who, had uh, who had raised and all the older generation have died and gone. Now the new generation has come there and they were not aware of the God of Israel, how God uh, brought them from Egypt and how God led them in the wilderness and the, how um, supernatural thing what are the supernatural things happen in their life and how god dwell among them the younger generation were not aware of it and so they started mingling with the canaanites and uh, um, 
kind of nights and uh, this was like a disgrace uh, it was a disgrace to israel big israelites because they started leading a life of immorality and they started worshiping the idols of the canaanites so because the people started sinning they were losing the battle no more they were winning but they were losing and they went under the uh, they went under the slavery uh, or the bondage with the other canaanites and other kingdom who ruled in that place and when people cried out to the lord okay we see people cried out to the lord and god raised the first judge the first uh, judge in the book of judges we see the first judge uh, as a uh, uh Othniel Othniel uh in the, in uh, in chapter 3 verse 7 to 11 we see how god raised Othniel Oth Othniel sorry uh the spirit of the lord came upon him and how he fought against the king of Kushan Rishathim the king of Mesopotamia and how he won the victory and after that he ruled uh, he ruled the Israel and they were rest in this part and then we see uh, uh, the second uh, king was ehud and then shamag and then we see in the season of debra okay uh, we see how uh, people uh, before that i'll say we are going to uh, talk about the four judges that is debra then we will talk about uh, 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 we will talk about debra that we'll talk about gideon and jephatha and then samson these are the four people we are going to talk about today uh yeah so debra chapter 4 debra was the only female judge in the bible she excelled in multiple areas clearly one of the uh, one of the bible's most outstanding figure she served the ancient israel as a prophet prophetess and we also see she uh, she also served as a judge and a military leader uh, by leading the israelites uh, for uh, for a war against uh, the uh, kingdom that raised Uh, toward them uh, then uh, we also see after the victory she uh, she wrote a, she was a songwriter she wrote a song and she sang with the israelites and the two chapters show an exemplary moral character of debra like how she led the people though uh, to be an ephraimite she was from the uh, tribe of Ep ephraim and debra judged and led the people for about 60 years in the 12th century bc her oversight covered approximately 20 years of uh, a leadership before the canaanite war as the lord uh, uh, you know as she was a prophetess a lord shared a strategy and a promise of delivering these people she uh, she delivered the message to the israelites saying barak barak you lead the troop you lead the army and fight against the king of canaanite so that god will give us the victory but barak um, who was a friend of debra said unless and until you come with me i will Did not go for the battle so uh, so debra says that because um, you didn't take the leadership god will uh, uh, god will put uh, god will put the uh, killing the victory into a woman's hand into a women's and here she is not talking about the women leadership of her own but then killing of the king will be uh, uh, will be given to a women we'll see how the story narrates so what happened here is when they led to go against uh, the king of canaanite his name was uh, sisera um uh, they were f the army was very strong suddenly they went into the camp to uh, uh, to um, against the canaanites and we see the battle and the king of this canaanite was almost losing and he ran for his life as he was running he went into a tent of uh, hiber uh, hiber and his wife j uh, his wife name is uh, sorry guys jail i guess jail no, no i'm not guessing it's correct mm.
jail. Yeah. Yeah, that is how a name has been pronounced. Jail, J-A-E-L, jail. So jail uh, said the king of uh, Canaanites, Caesarea, come into the tent. And he came into the tent and he asked for water, but she gives him a, a milk, okay, which is a kind of a drink which was curdled, which will make the person drowsy. He was already tired because he was running for his life. And um, she she gives him the drink, he drank, and she covered him with a blanket or a rug. And he also told her jail to stand outside the tent. If Barak or the um, Israelites come searching for me, you tell them that I'm not here. So he goes to sleep. So what jail does is once he sleeps, because of tiredness, he falls asleep. Jail see that he is sleeping. She takes the tent peg and you know uh, nails it exactly into the temple of his head and he falls dead right there. Later we see Barak, uh, Barak, the leader of the Israelites, he runs and comes and um, Jail says come into the tent and see who's inside. When he comes to see, he see the uh, death of the king of the Canaanites, Sisera has been is uh, uh, lying dead there. So uh, Israelites had the victory. They got the victory, but not in the hand of Barak, but then uh, in the hand of her women. So that's what Deborah already prophesied. And uh, uh, Deborah, uh, recognized, Deborah also, uh, you know, judged the Israelites. The Israelites uh, asked Deborah to be their leader. And under her leadership, you know, there was peace. She judged uh, without any partiality. There was fairness and openness in her uh, judging the people she judged about um, you know uh, 40 years so there were 20 years under the slavery they bear and after that they had a battle after the battle for 40 years deborah judged with fairness and she refused to show any kind of partiality to the people so what is that we learn from the life of deborah uh, one thing is leadership resides not in the gender, but in the character and gifting. Okay, it's not about men and women, but then it is about the character and the gifting which the Lord puts in us. Our strength comes from the Lord. Deborah, totally dependent on God. So we can see the minute she started depending on God, God started moving in her. She was a woman with courage, with strength. And we can see, um, uh, despite her own uh, uh, strength, she relied on God. The minute she relied on God, God gave the victory. Um, and she led the people uh, in, in the light of God and it pleased God. With this, we will move on to the next judge, Gideon, to chapter 6. Somebody has signed in. Okay. Okay. Chapter 6, from 11 onwards, okay, uh, the, uh, the name Gideon means one who cuts to pieces. Okay, Gideon's hometown was uh, opera, opera in the valley of Jezreel. His father uh, was Joaz. Josh from the tribe of Manasseh in his life. Manasseh. Gideon worked as a farmer. Uh, we also see him as a military commander later part after he encountering the angel of God. And, uh, and he also judged over Israel for about 40 years. He was the father of Abimelech as well as uh, and also se 70 unnamed sons. There were 70 sons been recorded in the Bible, but then their names are not mentioned because uh, Gideon had many wives and through them he had 70 sons he also had a concubine and uh, abimelech was one of the concubines son so gideon uh, as a man as a person he was a very reluctant warrior uh, is also uh, he is also been uh, recorded in the book of hebrews under the faith of heroes 
heroes so gideon uh, like many of his he doubted his own ability because of which he suffered so many defeats and failures as he grew uh, that even he, uh, even when the angel of god encountered him and shared the plan what god wanted to do in him he could not believe why did god choose me a man uh, with so much of weakness a man with a uh, 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 why did god choose a fearful man in fact we see um in the book uh, of chapter 6 verse 11 verse 11 uh, can one of us please read 11 and 12 judges chapter 6 verse 11 the angel of the lord came and sat down under the oak in orpha that belonged to josh the abizite where his son gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it the midianites when the angel of the lord appeared gideon he said the lord is with you mighty warrior yeah when we read about him we see uh, gideon uh, been hiding from these uh, uh, midianites and uh, yeah we also see him uh, you know he was working in a wine press Uh, he was working in the wine press without the knowledge of anyone okay he was threshing the wheat there and that time the angel of the lord appeared angel of the lord appeared and look at the word what the angel of the lord said the lord is with you you mighty man of valor in some of the version it says man of warrior uh so you know uh, this shocked gideon gideon reply was in verse 13 we see oh my lord the lord is with us why then all this is happening around us and where is uh, all the miracles which our father told us about uh, did not the lord bring us up from egypt but now the lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of these midianites okay so we see uh, how uh, the angel of the lord uh, talked to uh, uh, talked to gideon and tried to convince him and you know no, uh, angel of the lord did not uh, god did not look uh, gideon as a weak person uh, but he greets him saying that you are a man of valor you are a man of warrior see this is how god looks at each one of us god does not look at our weakness but god uh, calls uh, uh, things as though they exist you know god want to raise gideon as a warrior so god greeted uh, sent the an angel to greet him saying you are the man of valor today even god is looking at each one of us and greeting us into the call and purpose of what god has called us god does not look at our weakness with gideon god never looked at his weakness but god chose him though he was hiding in the wine press he was hiding himself from the midianites and other people but here god chose him to lead a Uh, army against the midianites and uh, your uh, uh, your gideon is testing god uh, you know uh, he says okay if you if this angel is from the lord i will offer the sacrifice i want the sacrifice to be accepted and the angel of the lord he offered the sacrifice the angel of the lord accepted we see god accepting that sacrifice and the second test he says uh, if it is from the lord let the dew fall around this fleece he put the fleece and he said let the dew fall on the fleece first time he says and then we see the dew falling exactly we see that in verse 37 chapter 6 verse 37 said to god if you will save israel by my hand you have said look i shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor if there is a dew on the fleece only there should be dew only on the fleece that he put okay and the other part of the ground dry then i shall know that you will save israel by my hand and god did exactly what he asked for and again for the second time gideon in verse 39 he says then gideon said to god do not be angry with me but let me speak just once more let me test i pray just once more with the fleece let it now be dry only on the fleece but on the ground let they be dew so he asked he asked let the uh, let the dew be uh, uh, 
uh, let the dew be on the ground and not on the fleece he asked and uh, god did exactly how uh, how gideon asked god was not upset or angry with gideon for testing him why god was not upset or angry with gideon can anyone tell me though he tested god three times anyone in the class can unmute and share give him courage yeah it could be see our god is a god of understanding god knew gideon's heart gideon as a person you know is a very fearful and he's already been hiding he didn't have that courage so he wants to make sure it is god who's calling him to go against the midianites because they were very powerful people how can a person like gideon become a leader and uh, take the army and go and fight against the midianites so he was very uh, fearful so he uh, that, that was the only reason why gideon had to ask god for signs for three times but god was a god of understanding he understands us many times even we would have asked for certain things a certain signs like that but god in all uh, you know in his mercy in his grace he has shown those signs for us knowing the weakness that we have um, you know but god is encouraging us to trust on god okay so we see here the seven year uh, after the seven years of the oppression uh, of the midianites israel cried out to god and god chose gideon and uh, gideon raises an army he raises an army from the tribe about uh, we see in the verse uh, chapter 7 verse 3 we see he raised uh, you know there were about 22000 of people and then again uh 22000 of people and among them he chose 10000 and then uh, uh and uh, you know god said i don't need this many people i need Uh, you know god is asking gideon to choose uh, uh, you know uh, the right kind of people for the battle so how gideon chose the right people so he led all these people god asked gideon to lead them uh, uh, lead them to a river and he asked uh, uh, like you know a uh, river and asked the and asked the army to drink water so in the manner how the people are drinking water uh, god will choose the people so when uh, you know uh, we see that we see that uh, uh in the verse yeah uh, in number 6 the number of those who lapped and he brought the people down to the water and the lord said to gideon everyone everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps you shall set apart by himself likewise everyone who gets down on his knees to drink so here we see uh, god is asking gideon to choose in the way how people are drinking the water the posture of them posture of them mattered so we see there are two uh, there are two type of posters uh, some of them are uh, kneeling on their knees and drinking the water with their mouth directly on the river and some of them were like you know they were not kneeling but they were just last uh, lapsing the water like a dog just taking some water in the hand and drinking so we need to know how a dog drinks a dog never bends down to the water it just laps the water with this uh, you know laps the water and it's ready to run if any if it hears any sound it is ready to leave that water and run from there so what we see in the army here is uh, these people who were uh, on their knees were not ready for the battle but these people when the sign comes they were ready to run for battle so god chose the people who showed the readiness to the battle by lapsing the water in their hand so god chose the people whoever laps the water 
and that was about 300 people and now Gideon was uh, asking God God there were only 300 very less number how can I face the Midianites to a large number but then God said um, I am your strength you need to be dependent more on me so the 300 people were led by Gideon and God gave him a strategy um, you know uh, God gave him a strategy how he can uh, uh, carry the torchlight at one hand which is covered with a mud pot and in one hand uh, the um the trumpet with this he heads towards the uh, Midianites camp and in the midnight when always sleeping he goes and God clearly tells him you know we see that um in the later part of the verse, we see that how uh, when they all were resting, Gideon uh, gives a single uh, a signal. Uh, he splits the 300 into three groups and uh, Gideon gives a signal to blow the trumpet and it brings the confusion in the Midianite tribe. And all of a sudden, uh, they break the torchlight, uh, the mud pot, and uh, with the torchlight, they rush to uh, attack the Midianites and God gives victory to uh, victory to Gideon. We also see a significance here. Uh, the mud, the clay pot which they covered the uh, uh, light and uh, at the sound of a trumpet of the Gideon, you know, uh, the army breaks that mud pot and the light shines. We see the clay pot which is very weak. Okay, which is very weak, just like the Gideon and the army of Israelites. But when they broke that pot, the light shined from within. That is the strength of God that shines from within, which gave them the strength, which gave them the courage. The Spirit of the Lord moved on them and gave them the victory. We see the hand of God again in our weakness, in the weakness of Gideon, in the weakness of the Israel, Israel uh, army. We see the hand of God move in and through them and God gave them the victory and they overtook the Midianites. They drove them out of that place and you know uh, they celebrated the victory. With this we will move on to the next judge. So before we could move on to the next judge, what are the lessons that we learn from the life of Gideon? Can anyone tell me? You can unmute and answer because of I'm projecting the PPT. If you type in chat, I may not be able to see it. So can you unmute and answer so that your voice has been heard? And even in the other e-learning classes, people can hear what you say. Uh, one thing is like that uh, total reliance on God, like um, when Gideon chose uh, so many people, God wanted him to cut it down to 300. And uh, yeah, that is like showing how much uh, they had to depend on God. Yes. Anyone else? We also see how God used uh, Gideon in his weakness and God could uh, use even us to do greater things like how he did through Gideon. Okay, with this we will move on to the chapter 11. Chapter 11, the story of Jephthah. The story of Jephthah is one of the most encouraging and at the same time one of the most tragic story in the Bible. He triumphed over the rejection and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jephthah and he lost his daughter. How? Uh, he made an unnecessary vow uh, uh, and he lost his daughter. Okay, let's move on to his story. Uh, verse 1, chapter 11, verse 1 onwards. We see that uh, Jephthah's mother was a prostitute and his brothers drove him out to prevent him from getting an inheritance. So fleeing from their home in Gilead, he settled in Tob, where he gathered a band of other powerful warriors around him. When the Ammonites threatened war against Israel, the elder of Gilead came to Jephthah and asked him, 
could you lead the army against the Ammonites? And uh, Jephthah was uh, uh, reluctant. And then he assured the leader that he will lead the army after that. And he... Uh, he learned the king of Ammonites. They wanted some, uh, you know, dispute of the land. And Jephthah sent a message explaining how the land came into the position of Israel. And we also see the Ammonites had uh, no legal claim to it. And the king ignored Jephthah's explanation and they came for the battle. And Jephthah made a vow to God. Um, this was actually not required. But then um, uh, they were, uh, you know, if you see the background, Jephthah and the other the people grew along with the Canaanites. So Canaanites uh, had uh, this practice in them saying that for every victory, they'll offer a sacrifice. They'll offer a sacrifice. So Jephthah and all his, um, you know, uh, 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 excitement of uh, you know getting the victory from the Lord uh, he makes a vow to God saying that you know what uh, uh, after the victory when God you give me the victory over the Ammonites whatever comes front of me I will give you a burnt offering okay the burnt offering of the first thing that he saw out that comes out of his house after the war uh, so what was in his mind to make this vow is those days in the ground floor in the ground floor, usually they have these cattle, animals in the ground floor, and they would leave, uh, live in, um, you know, uh, first or second floor they would leave. So the uh, in the ground floor, there were most of the times the cattle and, you know, uh, were there. And what he thought is when he entered, he would get to see one of the cattle or the animal, and he can offer that as a burnt offering to offer the sacrifice to God. So with this in mind, he makes a vow. But when the Spirit of the Lord moved on Jephthah and he won the battle against the Ammonites, and when he was coming back, when he arrived home, uh, you know, his daughter comes front of him and uh, we see the scripture says uh, he had the one and only daughter and she runs uh, you know she runs uh, uh, towards his dad after the victory and you know uh, Jephthah was so much moved and he he tears his clothes and he cries he cries uh, saying that uh, uh, daughter what a trouble you have brought on me Okay, and he explains it to her. And, you know, is uh, the way he has brought up was like that. Uh, so the daughter confirms the father saying that, okay, you keep up your promise what you did for God. Give me two months time. I'll go to the mountain, spend some time with my friends. And after that, you can sacrifice me. And, you know, she was, after two months, she comes back, returned to her father. We see that in chapter 11, verse 39. She returned to her father and he carried out his vow with her. And, you know, we see Jephthah keeping up his vow with God. As he promised, he kept a vow. So what was the lesson that we learned from this, from the story of Jephthah? We see initial days that he was rejected by his own family, by his mom and his brothers, but rejection was not the end. Later part, we see as he trusted on God, with all his humility, he trusted on God. You know, God raised him as a leader, as a judge. Okay, but then at the same time, when he won the big, uh, when he knew that God is uh, going to give these uh, Ammonites into his hand, uh, you know, um, I don't know whether it is a pride that came to his mind or what, but with a lot of excitement, he said, whatever, he was in a haste, he made this vow unto God. But then one thing we need to understand is, even in the book of Samuel, we read in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. We read that as the Lord... As the Lord has great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, they, behold, to obey is better than 
sacrifice. So what is needed from us? Not the offering, not the burnt sacrifice. What God looks at us and he expects us is to obey him. Obedient, obedience is better than any kind of sacrifice. And we also should not be in a haste to make any such work because God is not expecting any sacrifice or offering from us because everything that we have belongs to him. Okay, so with this, we will move on to chapter 13, the last story of Samson. I'll quickly finish this. Uh, yeah, chapter 13. We see uh, Samson, uh, the so story of Samson was, uh, was a miracle. His mother was uh, barren and uh, an angel appeared to her and said uh, she would give birth to a son. Okay, and uh, he was to be a Nazarite all his life. There's some similarity between the birth of John the Baptist to Elizabeth and also to Samson. Mother, both were barren. The angel of the Lord appeared and told them that you will uh, bring forth a son and he is a Nazarite. Now, what does a Nazarite mean? And who are the Nazarites in the Bible? Can anyone say? Can I say something? Yes, please. A Nazarite is a is a person chosen to serve God even before his birth. They are usually people who are not supposed to be uh, their hair to be cut, something like that. Thank yes, you. yes. You're right. You're right. Exactly. From the mother's womb itself, they need to follow this. So the angel of the Lord appeared to Samson's mother and and he told him that, you know, uh, you will be, uh, God is going to bless you with a son. And he will be a Nazarite. You need to keep this vow. You need to abstain from any kind of wine, wine and grapes. And you should not cut his hair or beard. And to av avoid contact with the dead bodies. So we see uh, there were three, uh, two Nazarites in the book of Hebrew or in the Hebrew Bible. Or we call it as the Old Testament. That is... Samson and Samuel, even Samuel's mother was, we can study about him later, even she prayed and asked for a child for a very long time. She was barren. She, when she prayed, God blessed her with a child and he was also a Nazarite. And the same thing happened with John the Baptist. Okay, so uh, so uh, these these are the three people, Samson, Samuel and John the Baptist in the New Testament. So uh, when we reached a manhood, okay, we see Samson's, uh, you know, the lust provoked in him and uh, he married a Philistine woman uh, from the pagan conqueror of the Israel. Uh, though his parents warned him, but then he was uh, not uh, very keen on listening, but then he went and married her. This led to the confrontation and, you know, uh, there was a, a kind of... Uh, a uh, small battle among the Philistines and Samson. And uh, on this occasion, uh, he took the jawbone of a donkey and killed a thousand men. We see again the supernatural power of God over Samson. The strength that he had was from God. Okay, the strength that he had was from God and people, the Philistines were scared of Samson. Not uh, They were not scared of the Israelites or the big army, nothing. But they were scared of this one person, Samson, because of the strength that he carried within him. And, um, you know, uh, we see at the uh, later part of this uh, uh, book, we see how the Philistines planned uh, plan they found the weakness of uh, uh, Samson was uh, the women so they planned uh, there was a harlot called Delilah so they enticed her to go and uh, 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 entice uh, Samson uh, Samson and uh, get the secrets of him as he was weak uh, with the women and you know he liked Delilah and uh, he was living with her and you know uh, these Philistines pressurized Delilah to know the strength of um, to know the strength of uh, Samson and uh, you know as she kept pres pressurizing him uh, for uh, it says for about seven days uh, he had given a riddle 
and they had to tell the riddle out if not you know uh, each one have to get him a, a set of a new garment and uh, some uh, some prize he said uh, you know samson had revealed and uh, for the seven days you know these philistines asked delilah to pressurize samson to know the strength and uh, uh, to know the riddle and he also reveals the riddle and they get to know but later part of the story we see how these philistines used delilah to know the strength of samson and the minute samson could not bear uh, <clears throat> the pressure of delilah he reveals the strength he reveals the vow that he has with god okay and then the minute she gets to know she discloses that with the philistines and the philistines plans to cut off his hair the uh, uh, locks of his hair and then you know uh, samson loses his strength and then they come to attack him but this time uh, because he didn't have the str uh, strength because the spirit of the lord was not with him it left him because his hair was cut and then uh, we see uh, you know he was captured by the philistines they they uh, put out his eyes and he could not see and he was led by them and he was under the slave under the bondage of these people and uh, uh, the day they were mocking him and they were supposed to project him in the Phil philistine some kind of conference and they brought him to a place where there were 3000 men gathered in this place and they were mocking at samson and this time samson prays he stands as uh, you know um, you know samson prays and this time when he prayed to god to give him the strength as the one final act it had not uh, uh, you know it so we see here god answered Sa samson's prayer and god gave him the strength the power to break that uh, i'm just going to break the two pillars to break the two pillars where all the 3000 philistines were there when he broke uh, you know uh, uh, the whole uh, you know some kind of auditorium like it fell on all uh, including samson was killed in this place as he pushed the pillars apart and the uh, it was in a temple okay it was in the temple of the philistine so it came crashing down and it killed 3000 uh, philistines who were the enemies of israel and the saddest was even samson was killed in this so what do we know in this the strength was not in the hair of samson but it was in the power of god when he prayed god answered him so just like samson even we we may have gone astray we may have done things that displeased god but then when we call when we call upon god god hears our prayer and you know he restores us back when we repent we see god restoring us back to himself so in the book of judges we see that uh, when uh, when uh, when you know uh, when we compromise on obeying god and his command we see the enemy take over us they take over us we see that in the samson's life when he gave into the sinful lust of his flesh we see sin always has its consequence so we need to be very careful in the way we lead our life it may start with something very small but then it leads to something big though god gave many warnings to samson but he never gave heed to it he went in what he pleased or what he desired to satisfy his lustful desires he went and you know he sinned against god and because of that sin he had to face the consequence and in the last moment when he repented he cried he turned to god and you know he prayed and god answered his prayer so um, in the book of judges uh, we see that uh, many uh, uh, how the people of israel compromised on uh, you know on god's uh, uh, command of not driving out the canaanites or the amon right so the other people who had occupied the land if only they would have drive them out from the land they wouldn't have faced um, any kind of immoral or the idolatry sin in their life just because they compromised on that they thought these people will be the slave to them okay but they landed up becoming slave to them their god and they started practicing uh, their uh, uh, 
idolatry or immorality in their life and it led to many consequences and they had to uh, led to many sin and they had to face the consequence of their sin and all this showed that uh, you know all these stories we studied on the four judges and everything showed us the need of a redeemer need of a deliverer so in each and every uh, story that we studied today we see there is a need of a deliverer we need a redeemer not the temporary judges were the temporary people okay they were there for a time of period and then they died but then again the people went astray we see the cycle repeat again and again again and again but then there's a need of a deliverer god knowing this so who was our deliverer who came in the new testament who was a redeemer who redeemed israel and delivered them from all the hand of the enemies once and for all it was jesus jesus died on the cross he paid a great price for us and he redeemed once and for all that's why in john 3:16 we see what does john 3:16 say for god, for god so loved the world that he gave his only son okay that who so god will love the him, world yes shall not perish but have everlasting life just go ahead and say that brother yes whoever believes in he is a redeemer we will have an eternal life with god so jesus paid a price once and for all he was a deliverer he was a redeemer he was our judge and it's not temporary but everlasting so we know the need so we may think what is this battle all about the book of judges is only about battle conquering and fighting and taking but then we see it is all written for a purpose it is all written for a purpose in the book of romans chapter 15 verse 4 we said whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope so the book of judges and later part whatever comes the kings and other we see a lot of battles happening and how the lord was with them faithfully to deliver them from the hand of the enemies we see the mercy of god we see the love of god go hand in hand no matter how wicked the people could be uh, you know israel again and again they may turn their back to god but god was faithful he was faithful and even till date he's been faithful despite our mistakes but when we repent and turn to god god accepts us just like you know we read the the sto- the parable of the prodigal son he just waits for us and he accepts us this is what we learn from the book of judges that god is merciful and faithful at the same time anything that you would like to share sorry we took some extra time anything that you would like to share or add to it what was our learning from from this book sorry Okay. Let's end this class with a word of prayer. Can I request brother Subhashish to pray and end this class? Okay, pastor. Loving father once again lord we thank you we praise master for this beautiful day lord. Thank you for speaking to us from this morning. And lord I thank you for the pastor lord I thank you that uh, the way lord you have talked to her so that lord she could able to uh, spoken to us lord taught us lord in a, in a beautiful way lord we thank you lord as we are learning uh, from the word lord i pray that uh, bless us that lord every day lord we will see transformation in our life every day lord we will see god is speaking to us every day lord we will see that uh, our life is molding and we are a new creation 
Uh, Lord, once again, I thank you for each and every one of us, Lord. Though, Lord, we are departing now, but Lord, I pray that you speak continuously, Lord. Once again, I thank you for the pastor, the blesser. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Have a good day. God bless. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. God bless, Dibya. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. God bless.